welcome back. So, we are uh, discussing photo detectors. In the last lecture, I had introduced what photo detectors are, how they are different from solar cells. Uh, some of the differences will become clear towards the later part of this on the next lecture. I had introduced some figures of merit, efficiency, responsivity and uh, speed, the bandwidth, right. We will continue from there today. Uh, we will discuss a few other figures of merit and common types of photo detect, common types of photo detector, predominantly p-n junction photo detector and also photoconductive uh, photo detectors. Each has their own characteristics, speed and other things. So, th those things we will be briefly touch upon and what are the common materials used for different kinds of photo detectors, those things will you know we will discuss as and when time permits. So, let us come to whiteboard here. I had discussed about uh, the bandwidth in the last class or the speed, right. I told you about the transient response of the photo detector, how fast they can modulate uh, to an incoming signal. Uh, but how do you define bandwidth and bandwidth is defined in gigahertz by the way. When I say the bandwidth of a photo detector is 1 gigahertz, it means at 1 gigahertz you should be able to replicate faithfully the signal. If you have an, a signal that is modulating at 1 gigahertz optical signal, then your the output current should be able to modulate faithfully you know without lag. So, that is basically it means and that is, but there is a you know does it mean that at 2 gigahertz can it replicate? What about 0.5 gigahertz? So, there is an ambiguity here. I cannot just say that is the theoretical definition. What actually it means is that and depends on the geometry of the detector, whether it is a p-n junction detector, whether it is a photoconductive detector, there are different mathematical expressions to indicate you know uh, this thing. But in other words, you see the transient response that I had drawn last time. If you have an optical signal like that, then electrical signal will be able to follow this like that. So, there is this 10 percent, 90 percent rule I told you from 90 percent to 10 percent, 10 percent to 90 percent, what is the rise time and fall time? The rise time and fall time, right? If this rise time and fall time, this rise time is say TR, Fall time and rise time are you know in the same order by the way, it is not like rise time will be nanosecond and fall time will be second very rarely, uh, but it is typically you know it is in the same order by the way and your bandwidth actually is inversely proportional to the rise time by the way, okay, uh, rise time because if the rise time is smaller nanosecond, picosecond your bandwidth will become increased, increasing, okay. And this bandwidth is typically called 3 dB bandwidth for those of your electrical engineers you will understand 3 dB actually is a very holy number sort of thing, okay. What I mean is that you have a spectral responsivity in ampere watt. This you measure at DC condition. What I mean by DC condition is that you have a photo detector, your light is shining constantly and you are measuring some current. What is that current you are measuring and what is the light you are putting in here? That is your responsivity, spectral responsivity, right? Light is continuously shining. So, I will call this R of 0. Matlab the frequency at which the light is modulating is 0 because there is no frequency it is constant DC right you get some value ampere watt. The moment I start to modulate this light, this moment I start to modulate this light which means I turn on and off, on and off this light, the current here that I have also will go on and off, on and off. Now, if you take that average ratio here, that responsivity will not be the same as the responsivity under DC condition, it will be a responsivity as a function of frequency and you will see that if I take this. Uh, r of f by r of 0, if I take the square it is like the modulus ok. Over frequency, this is frequency in megahertz, gigahertz, whatever, kilohertz does not matter. You will see that your frequency actually falls down, oh sorry the this ratio falls down. This is called like the spectral you know normalized spectral response and this is the you know the sort of the gain you can say dB ok, it is the log of this quantity actually. It falls down here, this is dB, this is 0, this is minus 1, this is minus 2, this is minus 3 minus 4 and so on, okay. With higher, what I mean is that with higher frequency, this could be say 50 megahertz, this could be 100 megahertz, this could be 200 megahertz and so on, okay. With higher frequency, if you if you switch on and off this light at higher frequency, your responsivity also falls down at that frequency, okay. So, when you take that responsivity ratio with respect to the, the DC responsivity when the light was constant, your, your, your normalized responsivity falls down, you see minus 3 dB where did it reach? this point no, your 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 responsivity, your spectral responsivity ratio has fallen down with respect to the 0 bias response, 0 frequency responsivity. So, minus 3 dB this is basically the loss in a way you can say, where it has reached. So, it is maybe 210 giga megahertz or so. So, this is called the 3 dB F 3 dB bandwidth, ok. This is called the bandwidth of the device, it is called the 3 dB bandwidth of the device which is roughly 200 megahertz in this case. So, that is the that means, at 200 megahertz your responsivity at 200 megahertz will square up that and responsivity at DC 
will have fallen down by minus 3 dB. The gain would have come down by minus 3 dB. So, that is how you define the bandwidth. That is not going into so much detail. If your rise time is lower and lower, your bandwidth will become larger and larger. Okay? So, which means you can operate in this bandwidth very well. That is what it means in a way. Okay? And for that, your rise time and fall time has to be very small so that you have sharp transitions, your bandwidth is large. If your rise time and fall time are like 1 second, 1 second, which means your bandwidth will be only 1 hertz. Okay? 1 hertz. So, your rise time, if it is 1 millisecond, your bandwidth will be in the ratio, in the range of 1 kilohertz approximately. Okay? There will be some factors there. So, this is what it means. Uh, we will come to this again later when we discuss the specific kinds of photo detector, but this is your bandwidth. I call it B or I can call it F 3 dB. It is a 3 dB bandwidth. Higher the 3 dB bandwidth, faster is the device, lower is the rise time. Okay? Please keep that in mind. So, this is an important figure of merit that I had discussed. The next figure of merit which is very important connected to this is called noise. What is the performance of your photo detector with noise? There will always be a background noise, there will be always many kinds of noise. What is your photo detector's performance with respect to noise is very important. It is not important for solar cell. In solar cell, you deliver higher amount of power to the load. You do not care about noise so much. Photo detectors are very important in terms of noise. Okay? What is the because in photo detectors, you want to detect as faint a signal as you can. What is the faintest signal you can detect? Very faint coming from outer space or something. So, noise is very important unlike in solar cell. So, noise, there is a quantity called noise equivalent power. Please remember noise equivalent power. It means what is that minimum optical input power at which the signal to noise ratio becomes 1. You know SNR, signal to noise ratio. That means, uh, in qualitatively you can think that you have a very high amount of input signal. So, you know there is definitely uh, much higher than the noise. The question is if you reduce the input signal, keep reducing it, keep reducing it, keep reducing it, what is that minimum input signal at which the signal and noise will become same? Okay, that is called noise equivalent power. Okay? You, that is called noise equivalent power, you want it to be very low. That means, you can go to much lower threshold of noise okay? and noise equivalent power noise okay uh, noise equivalent power is given by uh, i n square sorry okay i n square by uh, responsivity what does it mean this quantity actually is called uh, mean square noise current noise will give some current actually it is called the mean square noise current. You do not have to worry so much about it. Uh, we will come to that. There are essentially two types of noise. One is called the quantum noise, quantum noise or also you can call it as short noise. This noise arises because of the quantum nature of the distribution of electrons holes and the photons and this comes from the statistical nature of that uncertainty principle. Okay? Your arrival of the electron holes or photons and the generation of electron holes has this quantum noise and then there is a thermal noise. This is one kind of noise and thermal noise is the other kind of noise. Thermal noise comes because of the resistance, the fluctuation of carriers in the resistance because you will always have some resistance in the device. So, that resistance and thermal radiation, thermal fluctuation will lead to some kind of thermal noise. So, these are the two kinds of noise and your essentially the power, the noise power that you get will be correlated with this thermal uh, noise as well as the short noise and this is a very important figure of merit by the way. So, I will tell you do not have to worry so much this noise equivalent power there are formulas that are derived you do not have to worry this noise equivalent power uh, actually if you look at it, it will go as the square root of 2 times charge of electrons times dark current. Okay, this dark current actually is a kind of a quantum noise. This dark current is the background noise, no? the background leakage current. In the absence of light, dark current is your leakage current. So, that higher leakage current contributes to higher noise or worse device performance. You want the dark current leakage current to be as low as possible. That is why this is the dark current 2 Q I D okay? plus there is a thermal, this is because of the, this comes because of the quantum noise. Then there is a thermal which is 4, this is Boltzmann constant K T. Uh, by the resistance, this is I will give smaller. This is the resistance of the, the zero bias resistance of the device divided by the spectral responsivity into square root of the bandwidth. Please keep look at this expression carefully. This is noise equivalent power and noise equivalent power tells you what is the minimum, you know the signal that will basically make it equal to noise. The noise equivalent power goes as it becomes higher 
if your dark current is higher your dark current in a device should be as low as possible because if your dark current is higher then your noise equivalent power will go high which means your signal that you can detect is a higher signal low you cannot detect a much lower signal it means your noise threshold is worse it's come up it also this is a thermal component this depends on the r small r which is the resistance of the device you have to make sure the resistance is as large as possible when i say resistance this is the zero bias resistance of the dark current so if you look at the this is the dark current this is the dark current sorry this is voltage this is the dark current iv this slope here this resistance should be as high as possible which means the current dark current should be as low as possible that is another way of saying it you can okay so your uh, noise equivalent power should be you want to minimize the noise equivalent power so you want to actually have a you can cool down the system then t will come down of course or you can have a higher zero bias resistance and of course you want a high responsivity this is spectral responsivity i told you ampere per watt a high responsivity in other words a high efficiency also will make sure your noise equivalent power has come down which means you can detect a lower noise equivalent power means that you can detect lower signal of lower magnitude signal which are faint which are weak which means your noise flow is pretty low which is good if your noise equivalent power is high it means you can detect only signal of higher magnitude which means your noise flow is high which is not a good thing okay one thing is that it depends square root of bandwidth the noise equivalent power depends square root of bandwidth which means if you have a faster device if you have a faster device your bandwidth is more your noise equivalent power also is more it means your noise performance will become worse if your device becomes faster so to minimize the noise you have to make the device slightly slower in other words noise and speed they trade off with each other you cannot get better noise performance and higher speed at the same time okay if the carriers have to respond very fast they also give you higher noise okay so this is important but this noise equivalent power is important but one more important but see this noise equivalent power doesn't take into account area suppose i have a photo detector which is say you know uh, one millimeter by one millimeter area this is the photo detector i have like i can buy commercially but you have a photo detector which is much large suppose you have it one centimeter by one centimeter area the light that you will detect here is much more in quantity because your large area the light i will detect is much smaller area so then this things becomes not so good so you have to normalize that okay and also you know my your my detector might be working at 1 gigahertz your detector might be such that it works at 1 megahertz so then your noise and my noise will be so different i cannot compare mine with yours because you know our device's size is different at the speed at which they work is different how can you compare noise so for that you have under important parameter it's called specific detectivity and it takes into account all of this and so people nowadays only talk about spe specific detectivity so much specific detectivity is basically represented by d star and it is basically your uh, no inverse of noise equivalent power so which means your spec specific detectivity should be as high as possible higher the better matlab the higher the better okay specific detectivity should, should be higher okay and here you will have a normalizing factor which is square root of the area times square root of the bandwidth you take into account the bandwidth you take into account the area the square root square root you take so that that it becomes sort of normalized and the unit is centimeter square root of hertz by watt this quantity is also called jones and a good detectivity a specific detectivity would be say 10 to the power 14 jones is a very good detectivity okay 10 to the power 10 would be not a good detectivity so what it means is this is the unit so it takes into account the inverse of photo, uh, the noise equivalent power also a higher detectivity means that normalized to the area normalized to the bandwidth you are able to detect much fainter signals okay so these are the main important parameters of a, a figure of merit of a photo detector uh, so we have studied them so we now are now aware of that uh, so you know now i'll come to the types of photo detector types of um, photo detector in semiconductor photo detector there are many kinds of photo detector one is photo conductive photo conductive detector which means it's like a photo conductor it's like a photo conductor you have a it's like a photo conductor here okay it's a photo conductor here 
uh, you can assume that you are making an ohmic contact here and um, you know you are shining light and getting electricity out from here. Uh, you have both electrons and holes in this and that light of appropriate wavelengths can be absorbed here. Okay. So, I can say that you know I am making an ohmic contact on this side, ohmic contact on this side, uh, I will apply voltage that is why this way like that. Uh, I can assume that this the distance over which electrons and holes shining light will come from the top everywhere uniform okay, light will come from the top. Uh, the photo electrons ho excess holes and electrons will be generated they will be swept away by this applied field you have to apply a field this length is L the length over which electrons and holes have to drift to come out of the circuit. Okay. The th thickness of the slab is suppose D and your uh, the width the width of this device along this is suppose W okay, is suppose W. So, uh, now you are applying a voltage uh, as I told you you might be applying a voltage maybe a V around it applying voltage your shining light you will be getting some electricity this is I photon. Okay. This is called like a photoconductive detector okay. this is called a photoconductive detector it can be a high resistance detector but you are assuming that you are making an ohmic contact the resistance of this the, the conductivity of this will be Q mu of electron into N plus Q, holes also could be there because you will have excess holes when you shine light Q P times P this is your con conductivity. Okay. In dark it will be a conductivity in photo it will photo conductivity will be, if this is your dark conductivity then photo conductivity will be sigma P H okay. uh, the, the, the under the light your photo conductivity will increase the difference between the total conductivity minus the dark conductivity will be your true photo conductivity excuse me. Okay. Uh, so, now if I have this so suppose I am shining light from the top how much light is getting absorbed here do you know uh, that actually tells you this is the thickness is D please remember this thickness is D. In general if you take a slab of material whose thickness is D and you are shining light the light intensity decreases as the thickness increases right because it will get ab absorbed there is this Lambert Beer Lambert's law if you recall. So, essentially the light that is absorbed there is directly proportional to uh, the external quantum efficiency which is 1 minus e to the power minus alpha d this d is the thickness of this material okay and alpha is basically the absorption coefficient how well the material absorbs your light and absorption coefficient will be better or higher for a direct band gap material and lower or worse for an indirect band gap material. So, alpha 1 minus 1 minus e to the power minus alpha d gives you the fraction of light that is absorbed in the thickness material of thickness d it is a measure of the external quantum efficiency by the way. Okay. So, uh, you know if I am shining a light of say POP that is the intensity optical intensity I am giving you and if the efficiency of, uh, of uh, the, the external quantum efficiency is you know eta of E then the rate in this kind of a device this is a photoconductor detector rate of you know the generation the photo generation the rate at which you are generating carriers will be equal to the efficiency times the optical signal that you are shining by H C by lambda. Okay that has to be equal to the total photo carriers that are generated in this block divided by the lifetime. Okay. The total carriers that are generated there is n, n is the you know the, 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 the total the optical generation rate you can say into the volume per centimeter cube into centimeter cube that will be L W D by lifetime that is your this is your rate of photo generation actually. Okay. And, uh, the number if you if you this quantity that is there if you multiply by if you multiply by this lifetime then you get this quantity which is essentially the number of photo generated free carriers. This quantity represents the number of photo generated free carriers that is divided by the lifetime to give you the rate of photo generated carriers. Okay. So, the photo current in other words if you look in this expression carefully the photo current I photo current is actually defined as Q times the total number of photo generated carriers which is this okay, uh, which is this divided by the lifetime what is the number of photo generated carriers and this is person not per centimeter cube this is absolute number divided by the lifetime with which they are decaying that is your photo current. Now, this quantity is actually this quantity which is N E P O P by H C by lambda into tau okay, into tau you agree. So, that tau will actually cancel out here and this quantity 
will have to be multiplied by q by tau s. So, that will come out here. So, the photo current is actually given by q the optical power by h c by lambda into efficiency. Okay. Can I write it again? Photo current is equal to efficiency into the optical power that you are shining divided by h c by lambda. This is your photo current. This is the photo current which you will be getting. Okay. Please remember that. This will be photo current that you will be getting. Okay. Now, the photo current will be different from the signal current actually. The moment because you are also applying a voltage, you are applying a voltage, so you will get a signal current also. Okay. And that signal current is basically uh, how much total carriers you have divided by the electron transit time plus how much photo carriers you have divided by the whole transit time. Sorry, whole transit time. Do not worry about that. That means how fast the electrons and holes bringing the current out of this, this particular block. You remember this block in the last slide, right? Your light is shining from here. The expression that I had given for photo current in the previous slide was this. Uh, this is the photo current. The photo current is basically the charge times your optical power that you are shining uh, divided by h c by lambda. This is the number of photons into efficiency. Okay? This is your photo current, but because you are applying a voltage also no? when you are shining light because you are applying a voltage here. So, you will get some signal current also. The electron hole pairs that are generated, how fast are they moving out? So, how fast are they moving out? So, that transit is the transit time not the lifetime by the way. If you do some simple math, you will be able to find out the signal okay? and we will assume that uh, some of the things like electrons and holes might drift with the you know the mobility might be same or so on and so forth. So, the gain of a device this is a photoconducting photoconductor the gain is actually defined as how much signal current are you getting when you are shining light and applying voltage divided by what is the true photo current that you should ideally get. Okay. So, the true photo current will be q this quantity p o p by h c by lambda into efficiency and this will be by the way this quantity this quantity is actually uh, this quantity here. So, anyways so if you do that and this will be q and p h by the transit time of electron plus q and p h the transit time of holes. If you do that then you will get an expression for gain which will look like the lifetime divided by the transit time of electron. Okay. Transit time of electron how fast the electrons can move this is the lifetime by the way into 1 plus mobility of holes by mobility of electrons it will look like that. Okay. If you do some things like for example, how do you get that for example, the transit time the transit time of electrons for example, transit time of electron will basically be the length that has to cover which is L divided by the velocity which is mobility times the field, field is nothing but V by L. So, this will be L square by mu electron velocity. Similarly, transit time of holes will be equal to L square by mu holes times L v. Okay. So, if you do all this math then you will get this expression that is the gain of the device if there is a gain in the device that is the ratio of the lifetime the ratio of the lifetime of the carriers divided by the uh, the transit time of electron into 1 plus the ratio of mobility of hole by mobility of electron. This is your gain of the device. Okay. This is called the photoconductive gain of the device. Okay. And in general if your hole mobility is very very lower compared to electron mobility then you might actually cancel this part out and then your gain will be basically given by the lifetime divided by the transit time of electron. Okay. Lifetime by transit time gives you the gain for a photoconductive detector. Now, this is a photoconductive detector this is not a PN junction it is just a block it is just like a block of insulating material on which you are applying a voltage and you are getting some current but you moment you shine light you get some more current that is signal current. So, this is basically what it means. Okay. This is a photoconductive detector, you do not have to worry so much, but this is your gain of a photoconductive detector, the lifetime divided by the transit time, okay, the lifetime divided by transit time. Now, this is one kind of, but the practically you can actually go ahead and make uh, the speed will be, you know, I will come to this figure again. You know, if you practically think of this device, you have like a block like this, right, you have a block like this this is your thickness d, uh, light is shining here from the top, this is your width l, uh, this is the length l, this is the width w, your electron holes are coming through this circuit here, 
you know this L, this L is the very large length, if it is the large length then the electrons and holes will take much longer time to transit and your gain will be low. If your gain your if your gain is low, your total responsivity also is low because gain times responsivity is the actual measured responsivity. So, you want if you want a higher gain, you have to reduce this L. So, what people do is that they use uh, you want to reduce that L. So, what you do is that you make small small fingers. So, for example, if you have this I am drawing this as like at this thing top view here. Okay. If you have these things like that, then you make a device such that instead of uh, you know you do not have these tra carriers transit everywhere, what you do is that you have these small fingers, this is a small metallic finger, okay. You have to make a metal contact, anyways. Then you have another metal finger, okay. Then you have another metal finger, and the spacing between them is very, very small, okay. So you can have many of these fingers, and then you might have uh, you might have another set of fingers which comes in between you have this another set of fingers they will not short with each other there will be a gap small gap okay there will be a small gap here and then that will be connected to a bigger pad here similarly this will be connected to a bigger pad here so you can probe the voltage here on this pad and this pad you can apply but actually you are shining light onto this area so from the top it will look like this this is one figure finger metal finger this is one metal finger this is on metal finger on the other side you have this is on metal finger this is on metal finger similarly it will keep going okay so what will happen is that when you shine light please look at it carefully okay from the top okay this is again another metal finger similarly this is another metal finger so on and so forth. So, this will be another pad, this will be another pad. So, when you shine light, when you shine light uh, in this area, then the photo generate this will metals will block, but there are exposed areas like this area, photons will be generated, electrons, uh, electron hole pairs will be generated, this area, this area, this area, but these areas are very small, this may be you know 1 micron or 3 micron or 2 micron, whatever. So, essentially, the field the voltage that you apply on this big pad and this big pad, they will be the voltage will drop across very small spacing you see my point the voltage will drop across very small spacing it is like this is one finger this is one finger right and on the other hand I have this one finger and this one finger you see the spacing between these fingers is very small this is like 1 micron or 2 micron or whatever okay even less you can make so when you shine light and the photo generated carriers are there if you look at the side view this will be one finger there will be another finger here which is one of this and this can be one micron or two micron then whatever electron hole pairs are generated they, the their transit time will be very low the transit time will be very low because these are very very closely spaced this kind of detectors are called metal this is the metal there no again you have semiconductor below and again metal here another metal. So, these are called metal semiconductor metal kind of M S M sort of photo detectors these are lateral devices which means it is not a like a top down device like a p n junction. You have a block of material you have metal and then metal. So, it is like a metal semiconductor metal device you have to apply bias these are symmetric mostly because the if the both metals are same it will be symmetric if both metals are different it will be asymmetric. It is very easy to fabricate you do not need doping you do not need etching you do not need complicated fabrication steps you just put down the metals it is a metal semiconductor metal device it can be very easily done lot of research papers are published on this you can take any new material and put an MSM device. Okay. The speed here is limited by carrier lifetime uh, people typically use semi insulating or high resistive materials so that the dark current is low and you ensure shine light photo current is expected to be high uh, you know you can have this these are called inter digitated fingers inter digitated fingers and this inter digitated fingers can be spaced even sub micron so that your transit time is low and your gain is very high okay your transit time is low your gain is very high and the transit time gives you the speed of this device also so that is important to understand okay so we will end the class here today uh, we have finished most of the part of photo detectors I had discussed about uh, you know the other parameters of photo detector like 
the bandwidth, the noise, the specific detectivity and finally we have come to photoconductive detectors. I told you about metal semiconductor metal detectors and the properties you know it is very easy to fabricate and you can bring the metal electrodes close as close as you want which is called interdigitated sort of a geometry. Uh, so, these are very widely used you have to apply a voltage by the way this will not work without voltage that is why that these are not photovoltaic devices these are uh, with we have to apply voltage, but the dark current should be very low and photo current should be high and you want to get a higher responsivity you or efficiency you want to have some gain for that the ratio of the transit uh, the lifetime to transit time is the gain you want to increase the lifetime you want to reduce the transit time ok that is the time it takes for electrons and holes to move from one electrode to another electrode ok. So, these are photoconductive and, and you know MSM sort of detectors. One last thing is remaining that is junction photo detectors which are sort of PN junctions or short key junction that are can be used as photo detectors it is just like solar cell except that you can have a PN junction of different material like gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, cadmium telluride and so on the band gap will be different. So, the wavelength of light it can detect also is different and once you have those kind of detectors you can operate them in photovoltaic mode or self powered mode which means you do not have to apply any voltage. Uh, the expression for the speed there is slightly different. So, this we will cover in the next class and if time permits we shall also start LEDs in the next class ok. Uh, because uh, that is the final thing in the optoelectronic portion of the course how light emission takes place. We are talking about light detection now we should talk also about light emission then ok. So, thank you for your time I will see you in the next class.